Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Cohen, the author of An Introduction to the Art and Science of Chinese Tea Ceremony. Today, we're discussing Book 1, Chapter 6, Section 7, The Limits of Practical Hierarchies. Here to talk about this chapter is our editorial team, Patrick Penny and Ryan Ong. Hello, Pat. Hey, Jason. Hello, Ryan. Hello. My first question. I start this section with a quote commonly attributed to the statistician George Fox. All models are wrong. Some models are useful. What does a quote about statistics have to do with tea? So to the extent to which models um, or frameworks that you can put on something can generalize, right? They're never going to be perfect. Um, so hence, all models are wrong. But it does not mean that they are not useful in growing your knowledge and creating a framework for, um, for better understanding topics um, that you can use, as you put at the very end of your chapter, as a scaffolding um, uh, of knowledge as part of your tea education. Yeah, it's so hard, right? If we have all of these disparate ideas or notions of what makes up, you know, an oolong or what makes up a white tea, um, and, and there's nothing to really ground that information and bring it together so that you can understand, you know, the spectrum of processing or products uh, available to us, right, within our practice. Um, so really, it's just, you know, while it's correct or incorrect, it's not really important, uh, how useful are these frameworks to you? Uh, and I think we all know they, they definitely help to give you something to work upon and kickstart your knowledge as you build up, uh, you know, your tasting repertoire. And start to understand these teas. I continue this section with a claim to have proven that the preferences of contemporary practitioners rose from the Tang dynasty. Where will that argument be rejected? Uh, so I, I think we know that there are many, uh, you know, individuals that, that claim that our uh, modern Gong Fu practice, uh, they, they might even reject the word ceremony, right? They would claim that the modern Gong Fu practice is modern, uh, that, you know, it, it can be traced back to maybe some practices within the Qing dynasty, but that overall, you know, the 50s, 60s, 70s in Taiwan, uh, a lot of the tea arts, uh, as well as some revisionist movements came together to form the tea practice that we have today. Uh, I believe that, you know, in your argument in the previous section, uh, you showed where, uh, you know, Lu Yu in the Tang dynasty drew upon threads to create a, uh, a tradition of tea. Uh, and then through his works and the works of people to come, uh, they propagated the ideals within that praxis. Uh, and uh, at an idealistic level, uh, or rather at an ideological level, uh, we are still performing uh, the same praxis to this day. And we're still reaching for those same goals that Lu Yu uh, had established when he wrote his Chajing. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, there are going to be people who don't agree with you, uh, but hopefully they'll read the previous chapter and maybe uh, that, that might change some of their minds. Does it matter that the majority of practitioners don't know anything about Tang Dynasty culture? Does that change uh, the source of the origination? Uh, no, you, you don't have to understand uh, why something came about, why something works, uh, to use it, to practice it, etc. Right? Like there's so many things in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, we all use the internet. Uh, do either of you know how the internet works? I mean, you know, at a very basic level, you might have an understanding. Um, but, you know, if you talk to someone who that's their entire life's work, uh, they're going to have a very different understanding than you. Um, and it's the same thing for tea. Uh, you know, you uh, might be a casual tea enjoyer. You might think that, wow, there's certainly some history to this beverage. Um, you don't have to know, you know, that the tea ceremony that we know and practice today originated in the Tang Dynasty for that still to be a truth. I've asked in a previous section if any praxis evolved into a consortium of similarity. And we were, at the time, we were unable to think of an example. Now, what do you make of contemporary cinema critique and its culture of consortium? I, I don't know anything about modern day cinema. Critique. Original thought. Original thought. I don't read cinema critique. I don't know. <laughs> Nerd Writer One has some really great cinema critiques. Learned all about why the Titanic was the perfect um, melodrama. It's a really well put together critique. Uh, I, I would say that, you know, cinema critique was a great example. I'm also, uh, as Ryan just mentioned, not super up on my cinema critique, but, um, you know, when you mentioned that 
uh, within Cinema Critique, they're always looking for references, right? Uh, I don't think that's unique to Cinema Critique. Um, so I think we see that in, you know, a lot of literature critique as well. Um, even going through and writing, you know, this book, Jason, uh, we've had a lot of back and forth during our kind of behind the curtains editorial discussions, uh, sending back and forth copy where I'll say, Jason, why the hell did you write this? You know, this seems archaic or, you know, your prose here. I don't, I don't really understand why you chose this. Uh, and then Jason will come back with like, uh, you know, oh, it's it's a reference to Homer. Uh, and I'm like, okay, cool. Well, I don't know <laughs> who's going to know that. But, uh, you know, I, I think those kind of building off of similarities, right? Uh, we, we see that in a lot of other praxis. And as you read it here, wrote it here as, as citing out references, that actually starts to bring a lot of things to mind for me. Uh, so certainly uh, literature critique as well, like understanding, oh, you know, they were referring back to the Aeneid or something like that, you know, Virgil. Um, there's there's going to be a lot of places where you can see that if you know the reference and you see it, um, it'll add some depth to your understanding and start to build some frameworks around maybe uh, parables or stories that are trying to be shared within this quick line written by the author. Um, and, you know, I think maybe even uh, as far as similarities go, uh, Chinese motifs, right, within uh, porcelain. We can look at, you know, how certain flowers or families of flowers might have really similar meanings versus uh, how, you know, having one or two on a certain vase might make a very different meaning or be a different period. Uh, we can look at how they would maybe uh, showcase similar uh, meanings. So I don't know. It, it was interesting. I also uh, don't know a ton about movie uh, cinema critique, but that definitely was an interesting point. Does it exist in music? What do we make of sample artists or artists that reference verses from prior songs? 100%. Uh, I mean, even not, not just within the lyrics of music, but uh, sampling itself, right? Uh, you know, you'll hear throwbacks uh, to, you know, previously in the 2000s, a lot of hip hop, you'd hear throwbacks to a lot of the disco, funk, soul, jazz uh, of the 60s, 70s in a lot of samples. Uh, now, you know, fast forward to, to 2020 and uh, lo-fi hip hop is like sampling, uh, you know, songs from the mid 2000s that were not even uh, very popular at the time. But you're going to hear things like Nujibis sampled all the time in like lo-fi songs. Uh, sometimes it's not even sampled. It's just ripped off. But um, you, you hear it all the time and it's kind of showcasing the artist's uh, hopefully appreciation or tribute to that artist. Uh, and certainly when it is lyrical, uh, you know, knowing where they pulled the song, those lyrics from um, can help add some depth to the meaning behind the song. Um, but I'm not sure that it really builds similarity or helps you to uh, form the framework the way that we were talking about as far as tea or cinema critique goes. Uh, what would you say about it, Jason? That makes sense. Um, uh, in in uh, cinema critique, it's actually legitimately a negative critique to say that this uh, this movie uses um, steals ideas, takes ideas from all of these other places. That, that it lacks originality in some way. Um, that is not the critique that is usually given to to music or to um, other uh, other items. Um, in those types of references. Literature critiques are usually considered to be something highbrow, at least I think they are, that's why I use them. Uh, music critiques are generally considered to be uh, a reference to something um, or an, uh, uh, an ode to something. So it, it, is, um, it is interesting that the, that the same device used across different mediums is interpreted differently. Is that because there is a different practitioner base? Is it because um, that uh, readers are more forgiving than movie watchers? Uh, is it because music listeners are less likely to pick up on the references without reading uh, rapgenius.com? Um, what you know? What what is it about the the, diff the different groups of individuals that leads towards the different preferences for references? I, I mean, I don't have any special insight. Ryan doesn't read either. I don't have anything to add. Or Nothing least. immediately comes to mind. I want Why do you keep the, asking me these questions that I don't? I, I don't want it to be the Patrick and Jason show. You got to, you got to add something in here, man. 
my 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 rambles were totally ungrounded it's fine just whatever makes sense to you just talk about it what was the exact question why do those different mediums result in different preferences for the same device why are references in literature positive in movies negative and in uh, music unnoticed generalizing it's a conspiracy so I can I can just put in you know when when I hear in a song a reference to uh, an earlier work or an, another song or a song from a different uh, specifically like from a different genre right when you start hearing that kind of crossing um, you know often artists will use pretty uh, mainstream songs when they're gonna do that kind of lyrical reference uh, at in the hopes that you know I think the broader audience will hear the reference and understand it um, so like in uh the song feather right uh Cy star uh, at the very end uh, lays out lyrics from a you know american pie don mclean's american pie uh it's such a you know well-known song uh the lyrics at the end will be this this will be the day that i die right um it's such a well-known song that i think anyone listening to you know a hip-hop song will still know uh the lyrics from you know don mclean's american pie um you know, what What kind of deeper meaning is it trying to add? Uh, I'm not sure, <laughs> I probably would have to go on to Rap Genius, right? But, um, you know, those those references, I think, in music, uh, I think it, it's just that people like to hear something, you know, from wh whether it's a genre or an artist, um, they like to hear that crossover. It bridges kind of these gaps of worlds um, that previously felt so compartmentalized or separated. And then suddenly you have an artist referencing another artist and it feels like these worlds are bridging, whether that's just in your mind or whether that's, you know, in reality, you can you can start to draw ties between, well, you know, this is all music, right? Why should it be so different? But it felt it feels very siloed until you start to hear those references. Uh, so I think it just adds a dimensionality to the music, but it might not necessarily uh, specifically add any foundation or framework. What does the phrase everything is a remix mean? Isn't this too much of a softball? <laughs> Answer it. Uh, I would say that uh, everything, uh, I'd say that it means that everything is built up on each other and that all artists, no matter what their medium, um, are learned and they are producing their work um, in a certain context, in a certain time and place. Um, and they certainly are aware of other artists in the same or similar mediums um, that, you know, are certainly going to um, impact um, their work in some way, whether or not it's, uh, you know, uh, pooling directly from existing work and incorporating it in as part of your own. Um, but, you know, one of the phrases that immediately comes to mind is that um, good artists create, great artists steal, or some version of that. Um, and, you know, they, they know how to piece together the greatest components that are, you know, available and within their mind to create something um, better than the sum of its parts. That's a great line right there, Ryan. I think it's a good artist copy, great artist steal. I, I had seen an exhibition on it. I don't know. Uh, a little bit before COVID, but um, I remember seeing that like um, Van Gogh had a piece, um, I think it was like the Good Samaritan or something like that, that's very close to a piece from Delacroix. Um, and if you look at the composition of the painting, right, uh, the colors are all quite different, but as far as the people in it, the way they're holding each other, uh, I think there's a horse in both. Um, you know, it's it's only 50 years later, um, but Van Gogh's piece is, you know, pretty well known. Delacroix's as well, but, uh, you know, unless you see them side by side, you wouldn't know that uh, Van Gogh basically straight up copied it and just made different colors. And uh, I think it was mostly in the exhibition I saw, it's mostly Van Gogh. And he had things like uh, Dore, Millet, uh, you know, other famous cop uh, artists that he had really straight up copied and just changed the color scheme. Uh, it's worth looking up if you have a chance, but... Um, you know, there's a lot of truth to that, that, you know, um, everything has to some degree at a very basic level been done before. Uh, and you can take the foundation of those parts, add your own flair, and suddenly 
you know, if you have a real talent, uh, you might have made something amazing. Pat, Brian, uh, are you familiar with the Willem Scream? The one in Star Wars? <laughs> So the Willem scream is an audio effect. It was a recording of someone screaming and it's an audio effect that got added to the standard audio, uh, advanced audio, professional audio uh, editing toolbox. And so the Willem scream has been used uh, over and over and over and over again. Um, it is now in, uh, particularly by LucasArts, but also by many other films. It gets referenced in Toy Story and in other films specifically because people who are into cinema critique know the Willem Scream and it's almost an in-joke. So it's used both ironically and not ironically. Um, let's see if, if you can hear it. This is what the Willem Scream sounds like. Once you hear that, um, it's, it's very hard to unhear it because it just happens in, in movie after movie after movie. Um, so we got um, yeah, charge of the, at the Nether yeah, River in 1953. <laughs> Again, in the same movie. Third time in the same movie. This is then in 1954. This is Star Wars, The New Hope in 1977. Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back in 1980. Raiders of the Lost Ark in 1981. Return of the Jedi in 1983. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom in 1984. Howard the Duck in 1986. Okay, I think we get the idea because that goes on. No, please keep going until 2021. <laughs> that, that keeps going for uh, another, another few minutes. So my question to you both is, what is the Willem scream of Chinese tea ceremony? So I, I guess thinking about, you know, what is the Willem scream, right? It's something that is immediately like recognized by people who have heard it and had it pointed out to them. Uh, it, it can be, you know, referential in a both a positive and a negative way, right? Some people are going to be like, oh God, they use that again. And some people are going to be like, oh my God, that's so funny. That's from Star Wars. Um, so thinking about that. You know, I keep thinking about just saying <laughs> it's it's a gong dao bay, it's a cha chong. I'm trying to think about these little things, but none of that really feels right to me. I feel like maybe it has to be more of a, uh, you know what? Um, when I hear the Willem scream, the way it makes me feel is when I see a, a Western practitioner wearing like very gaudy Chinese clothes to brew tea. <laughs> I hear the Willem scream in my mind when I see that, like someone just like, okay, I'm doing a tea ceremony. Let me change it to my costume. <laughs> I hear the Willem scream in my mind. <laughs> I, I agree with you, but that is not a, a, a repetitious common motif. That is not a... Something what are you talking about? There's, there's, ton, there's tons of white dudes who throw on, you know, a Chinese, you know, like uh, silk garb with the collar and, and like that's what they do to brew tea. I like when they accidentally put on the woman's chi pao, not realizing uh, there's a gendered outfit. Um, but, but I don't believe that anyone's doing that unironically. <laughs> right, any thoughts on it? Uh, one that I find kind of painful is giving your tea uh, to a cha chong on your table. And you could imagine that it finds that the tea is too hot when you pour the uh, the hot tea would make the same scream. <laughs> that one's repetitious, Jason. I think there's there's people who do that every every time they brew. That 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 one might pass. My my answer is actually very different than both of your answers. My answer uh, is Qing Bai pattern, the uh, ginger gin blue and white pattern. It's used on real pieces. It's used on real antique pieces. It was then copied in Europe. Um, it's now 
very cheap uh, versions are made. Walk, walking into having tea with someone and seeing their very cheap Qingbai uh, Gaiwan uh, cups um, is, is, to me, uh, the Willem screen. It's the common repetitious motif that's uh, used because people like it and abused because people like it. Well, I like your answer better, but uh, just on, on the same thread, I, I did uh, go to the Seattle Art Museum yesterday. Actually, I sent you some pictures, which you asked me to email you, which I'll get to, but uh, there was a, a, there's a whole porcelain room there. Um, and just within that thread, there was, you know, Chinese Qing Bai ware, and they had a ton of European, so both French, Italian, uh, and Germanic, you know, uh, replicas of the Qing Bai ware. Um, and it, you know, some, some pieces it's so easy to see, actually not even just those, but there's also like Japanese Arita, right? Which very similar to Qing Bai. Uh, for some decorations. Um, and so it's, you know, pretty cool to see as you go country to country, this motif showing up. And sometimes the line is well blurred. Not everything was labeled. And I'm like, hmm, actual Qingbai, or is this, you know, really good Mason porcelain that they just made quite thin this time? Uh, so it, it was interesting to see that motif repeated over and over again. But yeah, you can look back, you know, at this point, hundreds of years uh, and, and see that motif nonstop repeating. And now I think with the advent of you know Kung Fu being really popular in the West over the past, well, really popular is relative, but popular in the West over the past uh, 10, 15 years, any vendor site you go on, uh, there's gonna be you know 10 different Ching Bai guy wants to buy. Moving this conversation along, what do you make of contemporary wood fire atmospheric ash glazed yishings? I make nothing of them because I've never used a yishing that has any kind of glaze on it, uh, other than external decoration. Same is the case for me. Hearing about it, does it uh, sound like something that easily fits into the contemporaneous uh, reigning hierarchy? Does it fall outside of? Uh... I, I think uh, you know when I when I hear uh, ash glaze and yixing, uh, I just don't. My my mind kind of has like two things that don't seem to come together. There's a fine line in between them. Um, I, I think of yixing and I only think of using it because it's porous. Uh, so if you're going to have some kind of glaze, why are you using a yixing? You could use any kind of uh, wood-fired modern uh, pot, you know, from many of the wonderful potters who exist both in the West and the East. Is it something that you promote the experimentation of, or is this, uh, is this a case where the current hierarchy, the current uh, imposed rules, societal, cultural, domain, specific rules of the praxis say that this is an area without experimentation or where experimentation should not uh, tread? Uh, I think it's important to find the right naming for it, right? I think when I hear, uh, you know, ash glazed yixing, well, my mind goes, okay, why? Um, but if someone, you know, if th this is where marketers come into play, if this was marketed to me a little bit differently, I could say, oh, well, you know, that looks really cool. Maybe the heat retention is a little different than a yixing. Um, and I could start, you know, playing the narrative in my head of why I would want to use one of these. And of course, uh, just like anything, I, I'm going to use it first before I make my mind up about it. So um, even though we've just talked about it here and I said that the idea doesn't make any sense to me, I would still love to try one and see, you know, how does it actually perform with tea? Um, so I think a lot of it comes down to how, how it's marketed, how it's labeled, um, you know, what is the terminology within the hierarchy that allows it to exist? Uh, because, you know, as you described it and as you laid it out, I, I can't make it fit within my mind, within our kind of classical hierarchy of, of wares. Do we think that wood fire yishings are superior in any way? My mind would immediately go to no, um, because you have significantly less control um, than you would in an electric kiln. It's uh, PID temperature controlled. So I would imagine you have greater temperature variability and some both known and unknown um, other effects that are happening. I, I would argue that that's a kind of a separate uh, evaluation. I think the manufacturing efficiency 
of the Yixings and how, you know, good they perform at tea can be two very different things. So certainly you'll have repeatability and success with electric or gas. Um, but I think wood fire, uh, as anyone who's used wood fired wares uh, will know or hopefully build up an appreciation for, um, you, you can certainly get unique properties out of those that you would not get with uh, gas or electric. Not always better, uh, it definitely depends on the medium. Um, but I, I certainly have a preference for wood fired. Um, I can't say that I've had too much comparison though between wood fired and electric uh, Yixing. Uh, Jason, I think we did a couple comparisons uh, when we were in Taiwan. And I think we had a few examples at the Institute. Um, but from what I remember uh, from a taste point of view, uh, the distinctions were there, but not really immediate. Uh, but often in the sound and the feel of the Yixing is where you could often really differentiate them. We, we, we may have had them, and I believe that we've only experienced them in Taiwan. Uh, wood fire Yixing are exceedingly rare because they tend to be Qing um, through ROC, um, Ming as well, and when available. And then in ROC onward, they went to charcoal fire and then oil fire, and then uh, either gas or electric fire much later. On, on the same topic, um, what do you make of uh, Taiwanese style oolong from Daya cultivar semi wild trees in Yun Yunnan? I think I gave my answer on this in a previous podcast. So, Ryan, I would love to hear yours. You said Daya cultivar Yunnan semi wild or wild? Processed as an oolong. A processed as an oolong. In the Taiwanese high mountain style. What do I think about it? Yes, how does this fit into your hierarchy, into your map of the world? Well, first, my immediate thoughts are that it doesn't, should not be processed as, as an oolong. Um, actually, it's funny because I was going to bring up this example, but the opportunity hadn't presented itself. Um, but, you know, as tasters, you can have mental models for how you expect flavors to be. And about a year or a year or two ago, I got this wild um, white tea um, from Yunnan, and I had very different expectation for what it should taste like than it did taste like. I'm always not nearly, it didn't fit into my mental model that I was constructing. I was like, okay, it's a white tea. Okay, I know it's wild. I also know it's from Yunnan, right? And my mind didn't immediately go to this is going to be really soupy and bitter. Um, you know, I thought it would be much more nutty and pleasant. Um, that was one case where my mental models were wrong and didn't generalize very well. Um, now taking, taking that a step further and processing it to oolong instead of, um, instead of, uh, white tea, I imagine that it does not taste very good. Um, I bet it would be bitter, strong, soapy, and somewhat disgusting would be everything that, from my experiences, um, would tell me. But I could, that could also be totally wrong. So I think when, yeah, when I had talked about it, I think, um, you know, I, well, I have had examples. Uh, they were bad. Um, but, you know, in, in my mind and with the framework that we use, right, any tea that has some degree of oxidation, uh, some degree of uh, very, you know, minimal up to very strong roast, uh, can qualify as an oolong, right? Uh, and so if if it's processed like an oolong, even if it's diet cultivar, uh, it's an oolong. And so, you know, it's not going to have those hallmark notes of chin chin, doesn't have the same terroir. Uh, you know, it definitely is going to have a different flavor. But uh, if, it, if the processing fits our model, why isn't it an oolong? And I think Jason had mentioned, uh, you know, is it not just reddened modern puer? Uh, and from the samples that I had, they certainly did taste like they were trying to be oolong tea. Uh, they didn't taste like pu'er. Now, I will say that I did brew them uh, as if I was brewing an oolong, right? So I did competition tasting style. Uh, so it's basically three grams in a ping mi bay, six minutes, uh, as you would do, you know, with like Lugu Farmers Association competition, et cetera. Uh, so potentially if I updosed it, brewed a little bit more like I would brew a shang, uh, maybe I would have gotten some of those similarities. But to me, it was an oolong. I've had some examples that were not my favorite, but not so bad. Now, do these two examples, uh, Yunnan Oolong and Ashley's Yixing, exemplify the limits of practical hierarchies? And if so, how? 
Well, I think the term in the food and beverage industry for that is innovation. Um, so I think that they are pushing the boundaries uh, through a process of experimentation and they will either be rejected or accepted by the current group of practitioners. Yeah, I don't think we want to be seen as staunch traditionalists, right? Um, while sometimes we'll hear of innovations and we kind of balk at it, um, you know, the Daie Oolongs being one version of that, um, certainly I'm open and willing to try any of these things, right? Even if they don't fit within my framework. Uh, so I do think those are two really good examples uh, where our current hierarchy and our current frameworks uh, aren't meeting, you know, the new innovations coming out. We're not able to really classify them. Uh, that doesn't mean these things shouldn't keep coming out. I want to see the innovation. I'm going to taste them. And then, of course, I will, you know, make my own uh, distinctions upon whether or not they're good or bad. My last question, where do we see practitioners outsourcing their preferences to hierarchies as rules to be followed? Uh, I would say an example that we're seeing that right now is with uh, early to mid 2000s factory cakes. Uh, I think a lot of practitioners, whether or not they like the taste of these teas, uh, uh, have been told that, you know, they're good. They're good for a reason. Uh, and so you're starting to see uh, whether or not it fits people's preferences. Uh, as a rule, they believe that these teas are good and that they are worth the price and that they should be seen as both an investment and a uh, valuable source, part of their education, if not a great tea for them to drink. But definitely only the natural stored, not the dry stored and not the wet stored. No way, not those. I would say too, you can take that back even further. Take the, the masterpiece era or the antique era puer. I mean, the people who said that that's the best puer that's ever been made come from a very different time, place, and set of preferences than modern day drinkers. And to what extent do we know that those are the best? They're basically what we're told. Um, you know, very few current, especially young uh, practitioners have ever had any real examples or good examples um, of teas from those eras. So, um, you know, we're, we're relying on the preferences of an older generation, and their understanding. Well, I think the three of us on this call can at least say we have had a lot of those uh, examples, uh, you know, of Masterpiece era, right, the Seven Sons era, et cetera. Um, and they were fabulous teas. But uh, that, that isn't to say that I think what you were saying was incorrect. I, I, do, I do think that, right, um, there are teas coming from a different time, a different place. Uh, we know them to be good because we've tasted them and they do fit our preferences based on how we were trained and I think our foundational uh, learning within tea. Um, but certainly if you just got into tea now and all you're drinking is young Sheng and you love it, um, you know, who's to say that you're, you're going to like a, you know, a blue mark or a green mark? You don't have to. Yeah, and certainly I'm not saying that I think those teas are bad. We all three of us have been very lucky um, to have tried some really great examples. Uh, and of course, they, they are fantastic. But that's also a product of uh, a lot of training and references for us. Um, we were very much taken on a journey to appreciate those um, over the course of many years of tasting. Enculturation. Yeah. Well, everyone, that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you for joining us in this edition of Tea Technique Editorial Conversations. Please join us again for a discussion of the next chapter, Contemporary Economic and Cultural Capital in Chinese Tea Ceremonies.